Hey folks, this is Mark Devine with the Unbeatable Mind Podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. Welcome back if you're a longtime listener. Super appreciate you being here. If you like this show, please refer it to your friends, family, peers, and it's very helpful if you rate it, especially on iTunes. Go rate it. We have a thousand five-star reviews. It really helps other people to find the podcast for credibility. So please rate this podcast and refer it. Really appreciate that. I am really excited today to talk to Katie Milkman. She is an award-winning um, professor at Wharton. What an incredible school that is. Katie has a podcast called Choiceology, and she's got a new book out called How to Change. And so she's a change expert. So I'm really excited to have you here, Katie. This is a, a subject that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, so thank you, and thank you for your contribution to this uh, important discussion about behavioral change and making the world a more positive place. So let's talk a little bit, let's start with um, like how you got interested in this subject and where, where did that come from? I probably yeah. something you studied or is it an academic pursuit or, you know, how did you get into this? Yeah, so it's the subject of my um, 20 years of research roughly since okay. I began uh, in academia, uh, but I didn't get into it because of research. I think I got into it because I was um, doing a little me search. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, That's usually the case, isn't it, right? So through self-exploration exactly. and try to overcome our own issues and challenges that leads us into some sort of expertise. That's great. Exactly. I was interested in this topic for that reason. And then I um, ended up becoming uh, an academic who studies it. And mm-hmm. I'll say that the moment when it became really clear how important it was to me was not at the beginning of my career. It was a little bit later when I learned just what a huge fraction of uh, premature deaths in the world are due to behaviors that we could change, which is not something I was aware of, but it turns really? out about 40% of premature deaths are due to behaviors. Like, Is it health, you mean not- health related deaths because people do things that lead to disease or... What do you mean? That's right. Right. Okay. Exactly. So smoking, mm-hmm. um, failing to exercise regularly, uh, drinking, mm-hmm. eating unhealthy foods, making bad decisions about vehicle safety. Mm-hmm. All of those things really add up in a way that uh, is just, frankly, much larger than I appreciated. And when mm-hmm. I learned that, it it gave me a laser focus in mm-hmm. my work mm-hmm. that there was an opportunity to really make lives a lot better. I was sort of studying this maybe half time and, mm-hmm. and looking at other curiosities in the world too. And then I got much more focused when I learned how big the opportunity was to have an impact. You, now you said that you were kind of doing some ex, you know, self exploration, self awareness. Did you have some bad behaviors that were leading you down the wrong road? Don't we all? Of course. I know, <laughs> but I want to hear your, your set of them. And I'll tell you mine. Yeah, anytime, of course. yeah no, I'm happy to, I'm happy to share. Um, I'd say the first the first thing that, that ended up converting into me search was when I was a graduate student, I was actually getting a degree in engineering. Mm-hmm. I ended up becoming a behavioral scientist, but makes perfect sense. Yeah, I was a CPA and then I became a Navy <laughs> SEAL. That also makes perfect sense. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's a lot, there's like winding, life is full of winding roads. That's right. Um, so I was an engineering graduate student. I was taking all of these classes that had, you know, they're very quantitative, tough problem sets. I'd go to a long day of lectures, come home, I was exhausted. And all I wanted to do was, you know, indulge in my favorite entertainment. So binge watch TV shows, read lowbrow novels. That's where I wanted to be. Uh, I knew that I needed to get my work done. I also knew I needed to get workouts in because my stress was, was always related to my ability to stay fit. I was a serious competitive tennis player in high school and college. And in graduate school, I needed a way to maintain that. But I couldn't drag myself to the gym either because I was all I wanted to do was, you know, binge watch TV. (laughs) So I ended up coming up with a solution to both of my problems. And I call it temptation bundling. I solved the problem by only letting myself enjoy those entertainment temptations while I was exercising. I actually got really into audio novels because it was a little hard to port a TV around in that era. I'm old <laughs> enough that, that was that was tricky. Um, but I would listen to low brow audio novels. So, you know, the, the Hunger Games, the Twilight series, Alex Cross, James Patterson. Um, and I would only let myself listen while I was exercising. And what happened was I would come home at the end of a long day of classes. I'd find myself craving a trip to the gym. Mm-hmm. When I got there, the time would fly because I was enjoying the, the novel so much. The exercise 
I barely even noticed I was doing it. And then I'd come back, recharged, energized, ready to work. And I already had had my entertainment fix. So suddenly okay. I was, you know, more productive in school and I was doing um, more workouts. So that was sort of the first thing. And then I, I, that worked so well for me that I ended up doing research about it. Mm -hmm. So I ran a study to show this, this technique, I call it temptation bundling can help other people significantly increase their exercise as well. And, um, it's just one example, but, right. but lots of my work is a little bit me. -search. What would you call the body of your work? Because it sounds a lot like habit forming, right? And so one of my friends and I did a podcast with him is a guy named James Clear who wrote Atomic Habits. And he talks about something similar about linking. He talks about my research in Atomic Habits. Oh, does he? Habits. Yes. And that's yeah, probably yeah. why it sounded He covers familiar. my work on temptation bundling. <laughs> exactly. That's why it sounds okay. familiar to you. Yeah. Right um, so that's, that's exactly right. So I would not call all of my research habit research. In fact, so this the book I wrote, covers a lot of different topics, including habit, because habit, at least to behavioral scientists, has a very specific meaning around right. a behavior that becomes so ingrained that it's automatic. You mm -hmm. don't even really think about it before you do it. And uh, some of that is what we need for change. Habits mm -hmm. are a great way to propagate change, but there's other things that we might want to do that are more conscious mm -hmm. um, and that are in our conscious control, like making concrete plans, um, thinking about ways we can avoid forgetting, avoid procrastination, mm -hmm. ways we can solve to make sure that our social environment is supporting change. Mm -hmm. So the book is broader than just habits and my work is broader than just habits, but habits are absolutely a part of that. Okay. Like a subset of that. So um, how does cognitive behavioral therapy relate to change in your work? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. I will, I, I should also admit in my journey, I had, I had knew nothing about cognitive behavioral therapy until four or five years ago when I started doing research with Angela Duckworth. Right. So my background is in engineering. Mm -hmm. Um, my, I've, I've never taken a psychology class and I know nothing about cl clinical psychology or knew nothing about clinical psychology until I met Angela. She's a close collaborator and friend. Um, and she knows a lot about clinical psychology and taught me all about cognitive behavioral therapy. And I was just fascinated um, by, you know, it's really, it's, there's these distinct academic traditions mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, they don't talk to each other enough. I would say, I think the way in which cognitive behavioral therapy is most related is that it does also emphasize, just like the research on behavioral science that I have immersed myself in, it emphasizes the importance of bridging sort of action and tension gaps mm -hmm. and figuring mm -hmm. out like what, what is it that's obstructing obstructing change for you. Mm -hmm. And that that's a major theme I have found. But but um, cognitive behavioral therapy is mostly about sort of observing what's going on in your mind, figuring out what those patterns are. It's it's very internally focused. And most of the research I do is actually about setting up structures outside of your mind, sort of in the world that will facilitate change. So like, for example, temptation bundling, while it's dealing with a psychological barrier, which is temptation, it's creating these structures in, in reality, I really didn't let myself do this thing out in the real world, except mm -hmm. when I was exercising. And so, so I think it's, it's different in that way. It's more, a little bit more externally focused. I see. So let's get but in. Actually, I, I have to say, like, I'm curious what, what you think, <laughs> how you think it's related to habits and, and how you relate cognitive behavioral therapy and habits. Well, I think CBT really precedes habit forming because we've got to understand how our current behavior is leading to the results that we have in our life. And then we've got to, you know, cognitively insert, you know, through, again, through a lot of your work, you know, first you have to have the willpower and the motivation and then the strategy to insert a new cognition around what you want and then how you're going to get there. And then the strategy about actually enacting that. And that's why it's a, it worked well in a therapeutic process because it's a back and forth, back and forth, and the therapist can can be the mirror, as well as the person um, providing new cognition or new cognitive models for the uh, the student or the you know the the whatever you call it, the patient, so to speak. And so that can lead to new habit forming. That's what I think. Yeah. But I'm, I just made that up, yeah. so I'm not an expert. That's interesting. Either. Well, no, it's interesting. I think <laughs> I like the way you said that it comes before habit. It's like. You need that motivation and you need to bridge the, um, you need to have the intention and the realization that right. change is necessary and that can come through the cognitive. Right, because I, I think you there. use the term motivation gap and, and, the, and a lot of people have that motivation gap, but there, a lot of them aren't even aware of what they want, right? They're not aware of the cognitive programming that's driving the current behavior. 
right? And so we've got to find that programming and then interrupt it and then insert some new programming. And then that starts, then you can link that to, to motivation and the strategies like temptation bundling that will then form a new habit, I think. Mm -hmm. So let's mm -hmm. talk about um, the specifics about how to change. And I love that title because it's very, very, you know, grabbing. It's like, I want to change. So if someone says, uh, let's say someone, let's say you work, do you work with individual clients by any chance? As an academic, yeah. you probably don't have time. Okay, so you do great. Well, I work, I work with them on academic research normally. I partner with a company I that see. will, that wants to create. So they some become sort part of, of a research project. And then, exactly, okay, so yeah. someone uh, in one of your projects comes to you and let's say they, they're overweight because they've got a behavioral pattern of overeating or, or binge eating or whatever it is. Where do you start with them? And they say, I want to change, but they haven't, you know, they're, they're 45 years old and they haven't been able to change, yeah. including, you know, the age old story that probably everyone listening has been through is like trying every single diet under the sun and finding that none of them work and they're in the same place as they were before. So where do you start yeah. with them? What are some um, of the issues that you have to deal with? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. I think the most important question I would ask them is what they find most challenging about you know, because it's not a knowledge gap, almost mm -hmm. certainly, when right. it comes to... Because the knowledge is out there. All you got to do is Google a few things. Right, yeah. Like most people than... know they shouldn't eat Oreos or Cheetos right. and they should eat more salad, right? So then, right. <laughs> then the good, like calories in, pounds on. So, But salad is no formula. fun and it doesn't taste good. And Oreos, oh man, they are so delicious. They are good. And I one know. is not enough. We're going to make people go get Oreos now. I feel like we're an ad for Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> they are tasty though. Um that's right. So, so then the question is, okay, well, what's the challenge? Is it that, you know, you mean to do it and then uh, you sort of forget to make it concrete enough, but like you don't have the right stuff in your fridge and you've stocked up on too much junk. And so you're mm -hmm. constantly unable to find something that's good for you and tastes good. Um, is it they can't, you just can't work the physical activity angle. And if you only did that, you really feel like it, it's just, you're too lethargic, you know, like what, what are the barriers? Mm -hmm. Um what's preventing change? Is it that you don't believe you can, like you've given up on yourself at this point and you need to figure out strategies that, that you believe could actually work and you just don't have that. So there's all these different barriers to change. Mm -hmm. Do you that, think that belief underlies everything though? I mean, like if someone wants to change and they can't, isn't there some belief system that's part of that challenge? I think, uh, I don't think belief underlies everything. I think mm -hmm. believing you can is important. Like you need to have some self-efficacy or confidence in order to get So moving. you have people who but come to you who believe, believe they can change, but they still can't? Sure. They're, so they're very, there's lots of optimists out there who are like, well, this year, <laughs> you know, this year I'm all over this time. And, you know, I understand why it's actually very adaptive to have that. I can do it this time attitude, right? right. It, you can see why we would evolve to have it. But, right. um, but then if you don't have a set of strategies, you don't get much farther than the optimism. So uh, for some, just different people, it's different challenges. And then the solution depends. Um, in the case of weight loss, I would say particularly common challenges are one we already covered, which is like, it just doesn't taste good. And mm -hmm. I, I find it so unpleasant that even though I keep meaning to choose the right foods, um, when the time comes, I am tempted and I give into temptation. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's two sort of really effective ways to deal with temptation. And I call them the carrot and the stick. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So and I'm, I'm obviously not the one to invent that terminology, it's just how I'm labeling these two categories. Uh, the carrot would be something we've a little bit talked about already with temptation bundling. It's a related concept, which is we try too often to just push through and do the thing that's most effective um, without giving a lot of thought to what will make doing it actually instantly gratifying. Yeah, some so, sort of reward for the effort. Exactly. Yeah. So you stock up on the kale and the carrots it's not even, you, you could self-reward, but even just, you know, finding healthy foods that are actually delicious, like smoothies, maybe it'll take you twice as long to lose the weight if you stray from an all lettuce diet, but so that's fine. So if I fine. eat the kale, could I have an Oreo? No, more like <laughs> instead of trying to eat the kale, find things that you find delicious, yogurt and smoothies and nuts right. and what are, um, 
what are the foods that work for you to still be tempting and, and they're still going to help you reach that goal. So find a way to make it more fun. Um, or maybe make it social is another way to make things fun that you're, you know, doing this with other people and you're eating together and you're preparing the healthy meals together. And that makes it a fun activity and something you look forward to. And so you don't, um, you don't back out. So, so that's the carrot. The mm-hmm. stick, which is funny because we're talking about carrots, which are not tasty. But anyway, uh, the, <laughs> the stick We'll end. set that aside for now. <laughs> yes, we'll set that aside. And actually, carrots can be very tasty with the right hummus. That's right. Um, okay. So the stick side is actually something that that I think is counterintuitive to people, but really powerful. And that is we're, we're really aware of the way that that a manager or a, pol- you know, a policymaker could try to constrain behavior so we won't give into temptation, right? Like... Um, they set, will set speed limits so that people right. don't drive too fast. Rules and uh, regulations and, and consequences. Exactly, and consequences. But we too rarely actually set those up for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to temptation, if you recognize it's coming, you can set yourself up for success by creating constraints that will make it harder. So um, one of my favorite examples is a there are these websites. One is Stick, one is Beeminder, where you can go and put money on the line that you'll forfeit if you fail to achieve your goals. And you can actually um, donate it, not, not to a cause that will be a silver lining, but to a cause you hate, right? So they have like hot button issues and they have charities <laughs> on either side, right? Like gun control or the NRA. And you pick right. your poison so that if you, and you have a referee who's going to hold you accountable. So that's another way that you can basically increase the price of your vice in order to make it so that even when you feel that temptation, the cost is so high right. that you won't give a in. Failure so those are penalty. a couple of things. Exactly. So a failure penalty. Jim, James Clear talking about that as well. Like he set failure penalties that were like really, really painful. That's kind of that's right. So there's research that shows that this can be really, me. really effective. Um, even, but you can set penalties around. You want to make them bite size, so not so much that uh, you know if I don't achieve my goal in a month, I'm gonna I'm gonna get there. But even daily goals around the behaviors you want to take, um, and that those small steps and small penalties can be enough to accumulate. Um, let me give you one more thought that I think might be useful from, from research, which is um, related to the sort of, do you believe in yourself and are you gonna commit and follow through? So there's really interesting research, some of which I've done showing that when you are asked for advice by someone else and you become a mentor, it actually helps you achieve your goals. So mm. if someone comes up to you and says, hey, you know, I'm really interested in your opinion on how to be a, a better student or how to, mm-hmm. how to lose weight or how, to get fit. Um, mm-hmm. th- this does a few things. One, it increases your confidence that you actually have some knowledge that's mm-hmm. valuable. And, and if you're a role model to others, then you must be able to do this yourself. Two, it causes you to introspect deeply and think about like what would work for me. And mm-hmm. we actually, in the case of goal pursuit, often have that knowledge inside us mm-hmm. and easy to dredge up. It's not like calculus where you need to teach you how, how it works. Like you kind of get it, but maybe you haven't thought deeply about it. And when you think deeply about advice to give someone else, it normally is advice that would work for you because right. that's what you have access to when you introspect. Oh, that's and cool. um, finally, when you say something to someone else, you're going to feel like a hypocrite if you don't follow through. Right. So it turns out actually being a mentor and getting involved in like advice clubs where you could, um, other people are, are trying to f- achieve similar goals and you're all coaching each other as different challenges arise could be a really helpful way to help yourself. That's really interesting. And as a listener to this podcast, I bet you don't eat junk, but when you're on the go, it's hard to find a super healthy snack. I've had the same challenge, like power bars now. I mean, there's, there's just, the, you know, a lot of this stuff has still has a lot of junk in it. That's why I'm super stoked to have Monk Pack sponsor this podcast. Monk Pack not only tastes phenomenal, but they have practically zero sugar, one gram or less of sugar in their bars. They have a keto granola bar that has one gram of sugar and three grams of carbs, only 140 total calories, and they taste absolutely delicious. These are great for anyone who follows the Unbeatable Mind lifestyle. But if you're on the go, which I know you are, you're going to need a snack sometimes in the midday or whenever. And grabbing a monk pack is going to be a great way to get the nutrition you need without the junk. 
They're gluten-free, grain-free, plant-based, non-GMO. So clean up your diet even more. Try Monk Pack and you'll see what I'm talking about. They are delicious. Go to Monk Pack's website, monkpack.com. That's M-U-N-K-P-A-C-K.com and use the code unbeatable at checkout to get 20% off your first order. They are 100% confident in this product that they back it with 100% guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll exchange or refund your money, whichever you prefer. Monkpack.com, select any product, enter the code unbeatable, get 20% off. Thank you, Monkpack, for sponsoring this podcast. My personal belief is that we need to supplement. Uh, It's tough to get all the micro ingredients and nutrients that we need in our food today. That's why I love Organifi, and I use Organifi every day. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offer plant-based nutrition with super high quality ingredients. Each blend is backed by science to craft the most effective doses with, like I said, ingredients that are organic and free of any kind of junk. And they contain a very, very low dose of sugar per serving. The one I use every day is the green juice, which is essential superfoods and clinical doses of something called ashwagandha, which helps reduce stress and support healthy cortisol levels. I also love Organifi Gold, which is more of a tea, a superfood tea. It supports rest and relaxation so you can wake up feeling refreshed. They also have a red, which is based upon beets, and boy, are they really, really healthy for you and healthy for your blood. So you can mix it with one of your favorite beverages or just mix it with water or tea, throw it in your smoothie. Uh, Either way, this stuff is a game changer. So Organifi, they take a lot of pride in their products. It's great tasting, and uh, they really support your immune system and your overall health. Go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com. Don't forget this. A-N-I-F-I.com slash unbeatable. And then use the code unbeatable to get 20% off any item. That's Organifi.com forward slash unbeatable. Use the code unbeatable for 20% off your order. Thank you, Organifi, for sponsoring this podcast couple things come up. First, there's such thing as an advice club or did you just make well, it up? <laughs> um, I'm now calling them advice clubs when you, when you do this, I have an, I have an advice club in my own life, That's uh, cool. but we, yeah. So my, the research that I'm, that I've done on this doesn't look at advice clubs specifically, but it looks at what happens when you randomly assign someone in an experiment to right. be asked for advice that they give that, to someone else. That would be a cool app, wouldn't it? To create an advice, the advice club app. app. <laughs> I love it. Let's do that trademark. I'll I'll let you, I'll give you 50%. I'm just kidding. That's actually your idea. You came up with it. So I was thinking about Gandhi. Um, This is a fun story. You probably heard of this, maybe even referencing your book, but some woman came to Gandhi and said, can you help my son, you know, quit sugar, eats too much sugar. And Gandhi looked at her and said, come ask me in a month. (laughs) And what he meant was I've got to go stop eating sugar before I can give this kid any advice on how to stop eating sugar. Right. That's so it's the same great. thing. He was like, oh, interesting. Got to yeah. walk the walk before Gotta I can walk talk the walk. The talk. Right. Fascinating. You use, um, you yeah. talk about the impulsivity problem. What is that? And how do we, how do we overcome impulsivity and addictive behavior? That's just like, seems so yeah. gr- rooted in, it's hard to get out of. Yeah. Well, temptation bundling is actually part of the answer, but the, okay. the key issue with impulsivity is that we um, are wired to discount dramatically whatever rewards we'll get later. And that's what mm. leads us to sit on the couch when we should be exercising. It leads us to so spend instant gratification the, is your main thing. You haven't learned delayed gratification. Is that what you're saying? That's right. And mm-hmm. we, we sort of recognize this in kids, right? But we don't recognize it in ourselves. So we're pretty unsophisticated when it comes to strategizing about it. We often think like, I can just push right through. I'm going to be able to achieve my goals. If we're more sophisticated and recognize, you know what? If it's not fun in the moment, I'm not going to do it. It gives us um, a really key, a really key weapon in the battle to change because so often change is not instantly gratifying. And if you can find ways to trick yourself or to actually make it fun, and we've talked about some of those, temptation mm-hmm. bundling is one. Choosing the kinds of foods you enjoy, the exercises you enjoy, mm-hmm. right? Doing Zumba at the gym instead of the stairmaster mm-hmm. um, 
it, it turns out we persist longer when we mm-hmm. choose the activities that are fun, but our intuition is wrong. So mm-hmm. research shows that if you just ask people, how do they generally pursue their goals? They say, I do it in the way that's most effective, not the way that's most fun on average. Mm-hmm. But if you instead tell people, no, go find the most fun way to get this done, they're going to keep doing it. Okay. I like that. It makes a lot of sense to me. What about um, forgetting problem? Like I, when I read um, about that, I, I really didn't know what the heck you were talking about. Like, cause people don't really forget that they have a problem cause it's with them 24 seven. So what's the forgetting problem and how, what's your research say about that? Yeah, it's more related to there's some, some, some maybe a couple of steps I need to take to actually get off the ground or some big goal that requires an action or a series mm-hmm. of actions. Mm-hmm. And I, I, um, don't follow through because I keep putting it off or I keep forgetting. Um, it could be something as small as, you know, forgetting to vote, but that can have carryover mm-hmm. effects, mm-hmm. forgetting to get a colonoscopy, which turns out to be really important to your health. <laughs> That's funny. I did that, <laughs> but it wasn't so much. I forgot. It's just that I, it just wasn't a priority and it just keeps getting, you know, kicked down the road. Yeah, yeah, you could. I, I'd say I put forgetting in the. I put forgetting in the general bucket of sort of flake out, which is, I mean to do it, and it keeps. Yeah, it keeps not coming to the top of the list. Right. And sometimes that is, that is, um, I literally completely forgot it. It like completely left my mind. Mm-hmm. And the other is it, it was not salient enough, mm-hmm. which isn't exactly the same, but it's a really closely related process. Like it wasn't at the top of the list. It didn't have my full attention and, and both forgetting and salience are attentional issues. And so attention is mm-hmm. part of what changes behavior, bringing attention to things at the right moment when you can take action. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and there's a few things that we can do about that. You know, I write a little bit in the book about memory palaces and literally trying to embed things more firmly in memory mm-hmm. through different tricks and, and strategies. But another thing that's really critical is when we make plans to do something that we actually have triggers associated with them. So rather than just saying, you know, I intend to uh, learn a new foreign language or I'm going to go to the gym more frequently, it's really critical to have, okay, the details of the when and where. And my Mm -hmm. research has shown, for instance, that um, if you're prompting someone to get a colonoscopy or a flu shot and you ask them, um, what date and time do you plan to do it? Mm -hmm. You see a very significant increase in the number of people who follow through than if you just ask them, you know, to do it. (laughs) I think that's Um, fascinating. And the power of language, both self-talk and inquiry, how much that affects individual behavior is stunning. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and if, and for, I don't know if you've had him on the podcast already, but I should note my friend and colleague, Ethan Cross has a wonderful book Mm. called Chatter. That's all about the science of self-talk. He's a professor at the university of Michigan and it came out earlier this year. We will, we will reach out to Ethan. I love it. He's amazing. Yeah. Excellent. He's the expert on (laughs) (laughs) self-talk. I'm kind of an expert on self-talk too. So that'll be a fun conversation. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds great. (laughs) You'll enjoy it. I promise. So, Let's let's again go back. I want to I want to spend a little bit more time on this subject though. So you mentioned that if you if you're specific with let's a date or time, like say, let me get an example. Um, you know, I teach a lot of people that daily physical training is really important, right? And we don't call it working out; we call it training because it's got to be thoughtful and it's got to be heading somewhere, right? There's a lot of aspects to that. And so I would say, you know, a, a, a well set goal is I'm going to do my daily physical training four times a week, right, at 6 a.m. And I'm going to endeavor to, to, do, um, to do that for at least 45 weeks of the year, right, or, or to do a certain number of sessions a year, right? So then you have, you can start to measure it. You can see when you need to catch up and maybe do some extras. And so you, it's, it's kind of like a cool, like you can track your progress and reward yourself along the way. As opposed to saying, you know, m- my goal is to lose... 30 pounds by joining a CrossFit gym, which is super vague, right? Exactly. So the, got it. so the language is partly, you know, how you frame your mission, your intention, and your goal, right? And then that Absolutely. becomes self-dialogue to you tell yourself, you know, I've got to do this because I've committed, you know, and you can add those other, those other kind of lever points like committing to your, your peers and the accountability if you, the pain points if you don't follow through, all that kind of stuff. That's but wonderful. I'd love to hear your uh, thoughts a little bit more on the language part. Like what other types of language levers can we use to, um, to improve our chances of change? 
Well, one really important thing that you alluded to is breaking down the size of the goal. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, one of my favorite studies that, that's been done recently looked at the difference in um, asking people if they wanted to save $5 a day versus $35 a week or $150 a month, which are yeah. of course the same. Right. Uh, and found <laughs> dramatically more adoption when it's $5 a day. Interesting. Similarly, when we ask volunteers at a, a large nonprofit um, to commit to a 200 hour a week, excuse me, 200 hour a year goal, um, and we either broke it down into four hours weekly or eight hours every two weeks compared to just that big mm -hmm. 200 hours a year goal, mm -hmm. we saw about a 10% increase in volunteering. So when we make those things bite-sized and proximal, it right. makes it feel more doable. And that language is so important. And wow. I, th I think you already have that intuition. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do. And because we use, you know, micro goals and chunking things down and also taking things just one day at a time, because even tomorrow's in my world is too far away. Cause I come from the exactly. warrior tradition, you know, tomorrow might be, <laughs> you know what, there might not be yeah. a tomorrow. So we've got to really focus in like, what's, what can we do today? to move uh, toward our goals and, and, and accomplishment. There's one other thing I wanna double click on related sure. to your example, cause I think you'll love it given that it's so closely related to what you're coaching mm -hmm. people to do. Um, I did an experiment where we tested two different ways of encouraging people to form a long-term habit around exercise. Um, one of them was every day at the same time, we're encouraging them for a month and we're rewarding them if they go to the gym at the same time of day. Mm -hmm. And the other group, we also encouraged to go to the gym. We reminded them to go at that same time every day, but we rewarded them whenever they went. And mm -hmm. what we ended up with was two groups of people who went to the gym at the same frequency for a month, but one group went consistently at the same time and the other group went at more variable times. Mm -hmm. And then we looked to see who had formed a, a more lasting habit. The rewards were taken away and we said, you know, which extinguishes faster, which one sticks around. And what we actually found is that the group that had more variability ended up building a more lasting habit, which initially confused us a little right. bit, right? Because there's so much- Because my mind was initially going, yeah, it's going to be the ones that had the consistent time, but it's not so. It's not so. And it, it, isn't the, the, it isn't that you don't want to plan or have a first best time because both groups had that. Both right. groups are getting reminded and both groups, at least 50% of their workouts are at that time. What we found is the group that uh, was only rewarded at that time, they formed a really rigid habit. So they were aiming to go to the gym, say at 7 a.m. And they went a little more at 7 a.m. actually than the, than the other group after the reward period ended, but they didn't go any other time. If they didn't make it at 7 a.m., that was it, they gave up. The other group had built a more elastic habit, a more flexible habit, a more right. robust habit. And they would went ever so slightly less at their sort of regular time, but they went at other times too. So when life gets in the way, which it inevitably does, we need to be able to have a fallback plan. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that was a really important insight for me because I made the wrong prediction when I set out to do this research. So, so yeah. having those plans is important, but we don't want to just have a, only a primary plan and say, if it fails, we, we give up. Right. It needs to be, you know, I'm going to try to do it at a consistent time and I have a fallback plan if that doesn't work. I love that. Cause you know, in, in our world, in the SEALs, we say no plan survives contact with the enemy or reality and uh, expect your first plan to fail. And so you got to adapt and, and to um, improvise on the fly. You got so it. It's that. exactly, so that's- Build that resiliency really into your goal or your change behavior. That's really interesting. That's, yeah, that's a really nice uh, analogy. And the last kind of big point that you want, that I'd like to drill into is what you call the confidence problem. So what, let's, you know, how do we go from, I don't know if I can do this at all, help me, uh, Katie, to I'm I'm confident that this change is permanent, and uh, thank you very much. Time to move on to the next thing. Yeah, it's a great question. The advice club is one thing that can help, right? Mm -hmm. When you form an advice club, that helps prop up your confidence. And but closely related is thinking about whether or not uh, your peers and the and the social supports and social structures you've created are conveying to you that you can do this. Are you surrounded by people who believe in you and who are showing you this is possible? Mm -hmm. um, or are you surrounded by people who are perhaps dragging you down? Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite studies of this looks at the impact of random assignment to your college roommate and shows mm -hmm. that when you end up in a room, freshman year in college with a roommate who has higher verbal SAT scores, your grades improve and of course vice versa. Right. Um, so you know, there's lots of research on how strong social effects are in, in all different walks of life from 
our energy efficiency at home to our retirement savings decisions. But it's something I think we can and should be more deliberate and conscious about is mm -hmm. who are the people that we're surrounding ourselves with? And are they are they giving us the right set of beliefs about what's possible? Are they are they role modeling for us? Mm -hmm. uh, or are they are they making us not believe in ourselves because they don't believe in us or because they're showing us, you know, it's not, it's not so feasible to accomplish our goals. Yeah. So that, that would be a big one. That's fascinating. Say. I, and you're right. There's been a lot of research on expectation. Um, even in schools, like the expectations that the teachers have for the kids will affect their. The stereotypes. Right. That you, it's um, really fascinating. Absolutely. And this plays into a lot of different areas in life. That's fascinating. One of the challenges a lot of my clients come to me with when, I, when we talk about this issue or, or, or related um, issues around people that you're with who are negative, which also would be like not supportive and not helping, dragging Absolutely. you down. They, all, they kind of feel trapped because oftentimes these are like their family or their, their wife or their husband or their, their work peers and they actually want to stay at the job or they're not, they don't know how to go get out of it. So what are some of your solutions when someone comes to you and says, yeah, but... Yeah, but yeah, well, yeah, but is, is a tough one. But in this case, um, the good news is you can always expand your network of peers, even if you can't, you know, if, if there's someone you can't eliminate who's dragging you down, well, one, you can talk to them about right. it, right? And sometimes a, a candid conversation can help, mm -hmm. but you can also expand that network. So maybe the people you work with and the people you live with aren't supporting this goal, but maybe you can join a running club and mm -hmm. that's a new set of peers who are going to support your goal to run a marathon right. and who aren't going to sit on the couch on Sunday and watch TV when you, you wanted to be out doing something active. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's almost always an opportunity either through conversations with the people who are in your life currently or through sort of an expansion of that network right. to, to have better peer effects. I love that. And the more advanced skill is to develop the mental control to not let the negativity affect you. <laughs> yeah, but that's the, hard. And that's I a little bit harder. In general, it's doable, I sort but it's of, hard. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, 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 in general, whenever we can avoid the just control it, just push through advice. Right. Yeah. I have found that we do better <laughs> right. because, you know, if we're, if we're putting that onus on ourselves, it's just, it's a lot of extra work. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah, I would love to wish you had more time to, to dig into that one subject, but because um, it's pretty interesting. What's next for you? Like, what is your uh, your big bogey in front of you now? Well, I run a center at the University of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. um, called the Behavior Change for Good Initiative. Oh, cool. I guess right. it's an initiative right. center. Re it's a research <laughs> um, group. And we're, uh, we're really focused on figuring out what are the keys to durable change? Mm -hmm. What are the things that we still haven't uncovered that make durable change possible? Mm -hmm. We've learned a lot already, which is what motivated me to write a book mm -hmm. on this topic and, and come have conversations like this. But there's so much more to learn. And in particular, I'm really interested in the question of um, getting back up after a setback, mm -hmm. because increasingly we find, you know, th there, there is no such thing as change that doesn't involve setbacks. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. one of the big things that, that kills change attempts is when people don't get up again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. there are a few things we've discovered already that seem to be valuable because they help people get back on the wagon after they've fallen down. And I think, I'm going to be focusing a lot of time on finding more solutions to that, more things that help people persist, stand back up, face the fact that failure is just a part of um, success. And, and so that's, that's what I'll be doing for the rest of my life, probably. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And I love the, you know, the, the more people who can change positively, you know, like Gandhi said, be the change you want to see and to have that change stick and be durable and learn that failure is just uh, part of the process of growth and becoming uh, m more um, complete as a human being, then that'll ripple out, right? And have a really positive effect on culture and, and on, uh, you know, kind of undermining some of the negativity and fear-based, you know, discourse that's going on in our society. You got it. So thank you for that <laughs> contribution. I know you've got to go. Uh, we'll have to wrap up. Um, where can people learn more about your work? And, and of course, the book, um, How to Change, is available, I imagine, at Amazon. That's a little small bookstore I heard about. <laughs> we got one in our corner. 
right? <laughs> it is. It's okay, available at, at large and small bookstores. Um, best place to find out more about me is my website, katiemilkman.com, which okay. Katie with a Y, like Katie Perry. Thank you. Uh, and you can find out more about the book, about my podcast, Choiceology. Uh, I have a newsletter, Milkman Delivers. Nice. If you like puns. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, um, and my research, which okay. is a huge part of my life in my research center. Right. Awesome. Katie, thanks so much for your time today. You rock. Appreciate the work you're doing and, and for your time. You know. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. This was really fun. Yeah, likewise. Take care. All right, folks. That was Katie Milkman. Go check her out at Katie with a Y Milkman.com. Uh, go buy her book, How to Change, and uh, listen to her podcast, Traceology. I'd love to um, love to have this conversation more with you, Katie. Maybe we can do it on your podcast next time. That would be great fun. All right. <laughs> thanks again for your time. And everybody, thanks for joining us at the Unbeal Mind Podcast. This is your host, Mark Devine. Really appreciate you. And uh, figure out how to make that big change. And you could start by buying Katie's book and learning how to make it stick. Hoo-yah. Till next time. Devine. Eight. Eight.